Hello and welcome to our panel discussion celebrating UCD's architecture at Belfield. This discussion around campus architecture and the development of UCD at Belfield is part of a celebration of space and place called Belfield 50, which is unfolding through 2020 and 2021. My name's Ellen Rowley and I'm an architectural historian based in UCD's School of Architecture. And I've been tasked with looking back at Belfield's origins so as to understand the significance of the place. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, the help of various archives, including uh, Vehert Architects and the Irish Architectural Archive, as well as UCD Estates and UCD Special Collections. So as Ireland's first purpose-built, coherently modern campus, Belfield fundamentally changed the spatial identity of Irish universities. UCD commissioned the foremost modern architects of the period to design a groundbreaking educational environment at Belfield. And that project sought to emancipate itself from the traditional quadrangles of older Irish colleges. This new campus, designed by a young Polish architect, Andrzej Wehert, who had won UCD's international architectural competition in 1963, modified a distinguished old suburban landscape to create a place for learning, sport and university life. And I should say that that suburban landscape was made up of no less than 11 separate domains, which were acquired by UCD over a period from 1933. So today we have invited four architects to consider Belfield. All four have contributed to the shape of this place either directly or through their practice or through their family legacy. Thank you all for taking part and let me introduce you. First off, UCD's Professor of Architecture, Hugh Campbell, will convene the conversation. So thanks, Hugh, uh, for coming on board. Thank you and welcome to Ronan Phelan. Maybe you'd wave uh, when I introduce Ronan, welcome. Ronan is a director at Scott Tallam Walker Architects and Ronan recently led the design of the UCD club. While his firm, Scott Tallam Walker, has had a long history at Belfield, ranging back to Robin Walker's uh, gold medal winning restaurant building of 1970 and on to Ronnie Tallon's O'Reilly Hall of 1995, to name a few. Valerie Mulvan, thank you for joining us. Valerie is a renowned graduate of UCD Architecture and her practice, of which she's a founding director, McCullough Mulvan Architects, has designed award-winning university buildings in Ireland and India, namely newly finished uh, structures for Thapar University in the Punjab region of India. In 2003, Valerie designed the extension to the Virus Reference Lab, today a frontline building of critical importance. Dennis Burton, welcome. Dennis. Hello. Partner. Hi, Dennis, is a partner at Robinson Keefe and Devan Architects, that's ORKD, where he leads healthcare and educational projects for the firm. And ORKD is the firm which, uh, or rather to which, Bayhurst was associated through the earliest phase of Belfield's development. More recent collaboration has seen ORKD develop the Quinn, then Moore School of Business, extend UCD's science blocks to make the O'Brien Centre, design the Charles Institute and UCD veterinary facilities, while ORKD are currently working on UCD's Centre for Future Learning. Last but very much not least, we are delighted to welcome Agnieszka Vehert pearson who is an architect and a partner in Mundo Architecture in the UK. Her father, Andre Vehert designed Belfield's original master plan. And Agnieszka will reflect on the role of Belfield in her parents' architectural practice. So thank you all, and I'll hand over to Hugh to convene. Thank you very much, Ellen, and thanks to everybody for um, <coughs> convening remotely, as we are wont to do these days, um, to talk about, in a way, maybe somewhat ironically, to talk about a campus that's intended to bring people um, together. Um, and premised on, on ideas of um, collegiality and, and of gathering. 
Um, but nonetheless, we hope that it won't be too long before we're able to do uh, to, to um, convene in, in real space again. Um, I might just start, I suppose, by going to each of um, uh, the three architects who have built on the campus to talk a little bit about their experience. And each project, I think, I mean, in one sense, the campus presents itself as something um, continuous and continuously evolving and something that exists at a very large scale. But within it, I think each project and even projects that, do, that don't get built as much as projects that do get built is, is a very complex uh, story in its own right. Uh, lots of different sort of act people involved, different stakeholders, complexities of sight, uh, complexity, complexities of grief and so on. So I think what we want to do is just maybe in turn talk a little bit or get a sort of snapshot of what it's like to work on a particular project in Belfield in those terms. So Valerie, maybe um, I would go to you first um, to talk a little bit about the virus reference um, library. And, and as Alan says, right now, it's, that, that building is, is probably at the epicenter of them. Um, and some of the people who you would have worked with on the building are very much in the public eye um, and right at the heart of the crisis we're working our way through. Could you say something a little bit about the maybe the, the purpose of the project, the functions that it houses, um, and, and how it then came into being as a, as, a, as, a, as a need that was identified and then as a building that you uh, began to work on? Okay, yeah. Um, I, I suppose I'd say, first of all, this probably has to be the smallest building in UCD. Um, it sits on a bluff overlooking the lake. It's a tiny site right at the back of a 19th century house, which is Ardmore House. It's hemmed in between this and the micro, medical microbiology lab, but it was designed to be seen within the context of Andre Waitchert's seminal 1960s master plan for UCD. And that, I suppose, from an architectural point of view, is an architectural promenade of pieces connected to a spine rather than an open green suburban landscape. So that's a really interesting place to start. The building was above all, it was an experiment really in displacing space. So it's like a, this integral box with its own reliance on geometry and scientific proportion. Uh, the experiment is like dropping a liquid into another liquid to see what happens. And here in this case, we were dropping this tiny pavilion into the strange leftover space at the back of Ardmore House to resolve that and to turn to face the lake. So in a way, we were saying we wanted to explore the spaces between, to drop a simple autonomous block into a space and work with the biology, if you will, of what happened, the block and its connective tissue, uh, kind of grafting it onto other laboratory spaces. And that made a kind of figure ground, which made a new positive space out of that leftover space. So the site plan, um, we kind of invented a mathematical resolving geometry to harness all these floating elements and connect to the site features. A fragment of the walled garden of Ardmore House, the lake, which was part of the Waitchart plan, the wall of microbiology. And we made this kind of triangle of natural materials. And then the floor of that space was poured concrete with timber sleepers dropped into a local river, the concrete was acid washed to expose the pebble uh, in the aggregate. And we got big boulders of granite from Wicklow Quarry and we put them there as a, a drift of accidentals. Um, so it, it was kind of like the elusive power of stone to suggest weight and randomness and the brilliance of scientific ideas set against the, the taut lightness of this little timber pavilion. And you can nearly describe the VRL extension as a building for an individual rather than for UCD in a way. We worked with its then director, Professor Bill Hall, and his energy and drive and interest made the building uh, kind of come into being over our conversations. His brilliance made it very individual and his grasp of the possibilities of the language of architecture to bring meaning to functional space sparked our conversations. So it was really great to work with him. And he also transmitted his excitement in his own research to us. So we had fantastic accounts of the process of tracing viruses and following leads and amazing stories of field trips to Asia or the Amazon basin and taking blood samples from indigenous people to follow um, viruses and, and plot transmission. And he, his, because he'd been to all parts of the globe, he had a huge interest in things like Japanese gardens and borrowed landscape. And so we had a, a lot of intense discussions about harnessing the power of landscape as a kind of contemplative thing to put exterior and interior places together as places to reflect after the intensity of the lab. So a bit like Salk, the Salk Institute in California, where Louis Kahn said, 
you experiment, you reflect, and then you write up the inspiration. And so in the same way, we were trying to make it an interior garden to get away from the pressures of the lab within that old wall garden of Ardmore. And it's to be read at a huge level. So we, we took on the kind of the idea of mathematics and science to make a language for the new pavilion, with the idea of cells and their fluid relationships into a way of thinking about the program. So the program was like a cell, which was the core, with functional spaces linked to it, like cells that had become differentiated. And it was a really simple program. It was like labs supported by a flexible social hub for staff and students, which was looking out over the lake. And the lab spaces over spill, like cells in the process of dividing and splitting off, um, into the adjacent building, where there's a reception point for samples coming in from all over the country. And then there's a relationship of connection between the pavilion and the arrival space and the secret interior garden. So all that um, kind of connected a really straightforward plan um, so we clad it in timber over a steel frame. It is really taut and light. It's a container. And what we see from the lake is really that, that uh, this, this timber pavilion, as you describe it. I mean, it's quite a striking because, as you say, it's quite a small, distinct form. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the projects made are, are of quite a large scale. And part of that, then, is that the idea that, as you were mentioning, Billy Hall, that, that there's that that there's this very particular character who... who and, and this very particular kind of almost intellectual frame of reference that you're trying to respond to. I suppose that might be a particular of working in the university that one comes across yeah. people like that. Um, yeah. You're trying to respond to their, what's driving them. And is that, was that the case with this? It seems to have been a, a kind of a, an interesting conversation. Yeah, it was. And I mean, we, we you know, the, some people, you, when you have a client, I, I always think that good clients get good buildings, in a sense. And it's buildings that where they really drive ourselves as architects and they drive the program and they push everything to the limit. And it's really great because in this case, we were able to talk about, you know, the windows being flush rather than recessed in certain places to give a kind of a sense of this skin containing everything inside it, like the skin of a cell. And uh, Your use of timber, because again, the timber is quite distinct in the context of UCD. It's not yeah, it was a, bit of an experiment. a predominant idiom, let's say, of the campus. It was hard to get the building's office to buy into it. And I think they were worried they'd have to maintain it. And when we said, no, we actually want the timber to fade to a sort of a silvery gray, they kind of relaxed a bit and said, okay, well, let's try it. It's not a very big area. So I think it's kind of, we, we use the timber with the boards vertical and horizontal to kind of create shadows and so on. Um, so it's very much like a sort of a Japanese thing about light screens that fold over each other and pivot and, and, uh, and, and give that sense of, I suppose, uh, breaking down the filters between inside and outside. And we were hoping this building would break down the filters between this building and the rest of UCD and, you know, kind of take part in the master plan and take part in the amazing relationship with the lake, which not many buildings in the master plan can deal well, with. And as it yeah. happens, the, the three, in fact, the three projects that we're talking about all have that lakeside setting in common. I mean, Dennis, maybe I'm just thinking maybe of going to your project because, of course, you're facing mm -hmm. the Bryan Centre for Science is the project that I'm thinking of. I know that at the mm -hmm. moment you're also working in Ardmore House, directly behind the mm. building we're mm. here, and indeed mm. on the future campus project as well. But 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 the science centre probably was not driven in the same way by an individual or a very particular set of needs. I guess it had to respond to a much more, let's say, heterogeneous set of mixed set of demands and different. I mean, you know, a jealousy of professors and like all kinds of very difficult groups that to get to talk to each other, to agree with each other. What was that process like, trying to, trying to respond to all of those complex needs and keep everyone satisfied? In, in a word, well, in a number of words, it was like herding mice at a crossroads. The truth be told, it was, uh, you're perfectly right. It, there were so many, many conflicting um, aims. And, and in fact, all of that and the complexity was compounded by a large, a large sense that it, the university were also very keen to ensure that the, the building design appealed to a generous benefactor. And a number of benefactors were, 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 were hot, sort of were, uh, shortlisted at the time. And one of the, one of the, the, uh, the, the fine uh, lines we had to thread really was to ensure that we were at, make a building that was fit for purpose, fit for place, sat comfortably within the this campus environment, and at the same time, uh, without it being um, a, a, a sort of an, an audacious uh, 
uh, exercise in, in bling was going to satisfy the, 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 um, the, 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 a, a potential benefactor. As it happens, the benefactor who eventually uh, sort of ponied up, as it were, um, was not of that opinion at all, and indeed was quite a modest man, and his name now sits on the building happily. But one of the things that we were, we were first charged with was the possibility of not building on that site at all, but building on a greenfield site out on the, on the periphery of the campus. And we really challenged that. And, um, and we, our, our determination was to turn what was potentially becoming something of a science ghetto into, into a science quarter, and indeed more than that, a really a new quarter for the university. And what we've ended up with, quite in contrary to the uh, virus reference lab, is a very substantial building uh, sitting in the same context as Valerie's building, but, uh, but doing a very different thing. And one of the things that we were really concerned to ensure is that we could take a series of now after sell by date uh, science buildings, which had, which which had sort of were siloed very much in their thinking, and and, and likewise the sort of the jealousy of of uh, uh, practitioners equally siloed to create a single entity, which was not just about science, but went well beyond that and became a, a, a tremendous new place for the campus, and also which would help to kill what was a very a very windy and windswept side of the campus, uh, with what had become which had set out as quite charming buildings that have become quite, um, quite dated in, 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 their, in their appearance and in their use. Happily, the fundamental structure of those buildings and their spacing was such that we were able to satisfy the, the sort of the desire for a greenfield building uh, within a brownfield site because there was plenty of greenfield around, which meant we could widen the existing um, buildings, we could extend them to make them more efficient, and we could then use a what I think is is is, is a quite a modest uh, arrangement of atria and openings to gardens to glue all those those disparate parts together, and. We were, and of course, the building is big, and yeah. and, and it's unapologetically big. But that's, but what, one thing we're really concerned to ensure is that although it was that in terms of its materials, in terms of its scale, in terms of its detail, that it's set comfortably within the uh, environs of, for example, the uh, the, the, the 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 virus reference lab, uh, the Aula Maxima, the the library building, etc. So that it wouldn't punch, a, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be a, a sort of a heavy hitter in that context. Um, so great, great care was was was, was yeah. given to. That. But just Dennis as well. I'm conscious that the the there was also an interest in new kind, new modes of teaching. I mean, like moving. Oh, very, very much so. I mean, the, 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 you talked yeah. earlier about the, the value of collaboration and collegiality and 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 congregation of people, which is it must be at the heart of, of all universities, going back to Plato and Aristotle and the the, the great philosophers, where people literally would meet at a forum. And one of the things we were really concerned to do was to ensure that we killed the idea of a siloed um, science ghetto, and we would create a place, a, a place for chance encounter, a place for people to meet, a real forum. And the uh, and one thing, for example, we did is we put all the labs on view that you can you can walk through the building and the labs like showcases, uh, so you can actually see what happens within the building. But in addition to that, um, although labs by their very nature tend to be introverted spaces, we wanted them to open out into 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 public space, and that public space in turn open out into the into the greater uh, the greater sort of university realm. It was very important to the to the thing. Also, of course, there was a, at the heart of the building were a series of now dated or then dated um, lecture theatres. Yeah. And again, we wanted to ensure that that element could play its part and participate in the, in the, in, in the overall complex. And so really, the, the idea was to break down the silos in science and then break down science as, as, a, as a sort of an entity within the overall um, yeah. sort of Barry, university milieu. Between the students and the staff of the faculty, that sort of start to encourage a more open and dynamic kind of relationship. Very, very, very much so. And indeed, as you know, part of the brief was to create places that were were unidentifiable as in terms of ownership. And um, at, at one stage, we contemplated, in fact, in in the middle of the atrium, putting a giant. Um, inflated uh, a, a, a sort of a, a castle that people would actually could have played okay. play, play 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 play. there actually yeah okay now okay. Now, now, <laughs> now sadly it never sadly it never came to pass it was it was going to be a great a, a, a sort of a great a bouncy castle but it never it never came to pass but the oh, thinking okay. came to pass and i think that was the important thing okay. and, and then just to turn to ronan then i mean maybe 
not using the Bouncy Castle as a segue necessarily, but just coming back to the lake and the idea then of the third side of the lake, uh, uh, we have O'Reilly Hall for a long time sitting as this temple, I suppose, the place where the university gathers for graduations and major occasions, a Scott Town and Walker project. And then the invitation to you more recently was to make an ad effectively make a new wing to that or an addition to it um, for this, again, a, a different kind of function, again, the university club, which was, um, I suppose, a project that was about making a different kind of gathering place, in this case for the faculty and staff, remembering that there's something like 3,000 of them, you know, dispersed across the campus, that this would become a place where people could go, an amenity. Um, and how was, that, how was that brief conveyed to you? What did you understand as being the aims? Well, <clears throat> this, this project really had its origin. It was the brainchild of President Deeks. And he recognized that this type of facility, which really this kind of faculty club base exists in all of the great universities worldwide and in other universities around, around Ireland. And that, that function was really completely lacking in, in UCD. So there was kind of two ideas behind the university club. The idea was that it would create a space where obviously the faculty <coughs> and the staff could meet together both socially and professionally. So they could meet and chat, socialize, grab a quick bite or relax in kind of informal lounge settings. But it's open not only to staff, but also it's for graduates of the university, the alumni. And also it encourages and welcomes like the business and academic partners of the university. So it's a place where you could offer hospitality to a visiting lecturer or a visiting faculty. Um, or a guest lecture on campus, and also a place that what Dennis touched on, somewhere where you could invite a donor and, uh, and welcome them into the university, in the university environment, in the campus. And the location and the setting of the club next to Riley Hall is key there because on the first floor where you put the formal dining room, you have this fantastic view south over the formal pond, and you're looking at some of the great original set pieces of the university, the arts building, the tyranny building, and then the new uh, sciences campus is on the right, and then the smaller buildings like Valerie's building on the left. Yeah, so it's a place you kind of get a prospect. How, how did, was it always the intention that that would be the site, that it would, that it would work in conjunction with O'Reilly Hall? And it, the, uh, it, well, as was the second aspect of the, uh, of the building, is while it has its own identity and it functions as a club, by Building it as an extension to O'Reilly Hall, it kind of reinforces the idea of O'Reilly Hall as a conference venue. I mean, you touched on the original design of O'Reilly Hall, which is this very classical building uh, that it sits in a formal setting and overlooks the lake, and it was originally designed as the Aula Maxima for the graduation, so it seats, I think, 1,100 people, as well as accommodation, banqueting, I think you can seat 500 in a, in, in a banqueting event. But I think the university always loved that building because of the, particularly because of the ability to, I suppose, welcome the graduates and have the conferring ceremony on campus in, in, in that very nice setting. And like many of the listeners, and particularly graduates, have been familiar with the experience of the conferring in UCD and then spilling out onto that lovely south facing lawn and taking photographs and things like that. So by using the club as an extension to that, you're kind of Upping the game, you're kind of reinforcing it as a conference facility. So the way we designed it now, if you have a big conference in the hall, you can now come through. We connected it through with a with a sort of a with a concourse space, and you can break out then from the conferences and use the informal cafe or the informal dining room or the seminars and breakout spaces. So it turns that whole building into. Um, it was a much better functioning entertainment, uh, entertainment venue. And it's, for, for me, it's part of, very much part of the outreaching of the university. So it's a building that's very much part of the campus and celebrates the, the, the design yeah. and the center and the activity of the campus. But it's also one of the key buildings that attracts the public in and, yeah. and kind of broadcasts the university to a wider audience. It's funny, it's, 
I mean, it's one of the things that strikes me about it is that it it discovers a bit of territory that otherwise would not have been thought to be there. A little bit similar to to Valerie's building, actually. I mean, that, that and it makes a it makes a place. I mean, you kind of get a little bit of a crossroads. You've got the mm-hmm. computer science veterinary buildings. You've got the science building, and then at your building, and then there's access from coming coming from the outside. So there's a sort of whole new front. Yeah, well, it's the site that never was. But it's actually built on the site of the service yard to O'Reilly Hall. Yeah. And it's kind of, it, it's interesting because it presented two challenges. One was the challenge of making a building that was complementary to O'Reilly Hall and that, but that had its own identity, while at the same time not challenging that very formal set piece onto the lake. Yeah. But yeah. to quite rightly say, as you come around the corner to the western elevation, it's a different environment. And that's that linkage. I think is very interesting because I think it's key to the position a lot of buildings uh, in UCD. That 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 axis is set up by the fact that there's a kind of a bus stop on on, on the dual carriageway at that point. So you get quite a lot of people coming that way, coming through the car park, yeah. and it's it's an axis which which serves veterinary and sciences, and then leads you on perhaps to the library. So in terms of the design of the building, why we were quite well mannered and well behaved along the line of the elevation of Riley Hall. As you come around the corner, we took a bit more of a relaxed view, and it's and the building is displayed as sort of a double height uh, garden, which is the is the cafe that links the cafe visually downstairs to the more formal dining upstairs. And that space is displayed and glazed, which relates to the geometry of veterinary. But at the same time, that splaying and I suppose canting of the building creates a little little threshold space. It's not, it's not a plaza and it's not a square, but it's a little formal threshold space, a kind of a, a pause before you enter into the building. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, that the, this, this sense that the campus is never finished. It's always in some iteration of itself. It's always in some, and we know it, and, it's, and then so, something new arrives and you see something else or a new connection is made or an old connection is rediscovered or an older building is reimagined. Um, and I might just hand back over now to Alan, because I think, Alan, you want to go back a little bit to the, the sort of first uh, origins of the campus, that um, Andre Vachert's master plan. Think a little bit about that and its history. Yeah, well, thanks, Hugh. Um, we were thinking about why did Vachert win the design? What was it that really wooed the, the competition judges who were a team of local, very modernist inclined architects and then a, a civil engineering prof, uh, Michael Hogan, and then two, two international judges. But they, they seem to be really taken by Vehert's um, master plan because actually of this, it's, I think it's fascinating, it's, impar- it's, it's rather its incomplete nature or its partial nature. Um, they kept referring back to the walkways. And so the walkways are at once creating, as Valerie suggested, this stem and um, this kind of emphatic line that then cranks. And then I think it's the way that that then this stem has uh, buildings almost like, um, yeah, I suppose petals or growths, this organic thing uh, that can be stuck onto it or feed off the stem. Um, so that on the one hand brings great cohesion. It also, because it's low lying, it respects the, the landscape as something that's going to be low lying. Um, and uh, really, I think one of the main points of potential and why the Vehert plan uh, continues to work and was chosen was that, that it, it always offered the potential for growth. And so this is very much the post-war reconstruction period and um, the, the hangover of that, um, where there, if this is really a period of uh, unpredictable growth. And, uh, on a lo- and so, so that's happening kind of internationally. Um, and, but then on the local level, in terms of socio, the socio-educational history, we have the growth at this time of uh, the third level sector, what's called higher education. And so, you know, Within the twenty minute, the the twenty years rather before Vehert said uh, before the competition, between the late thirties and into the late fifties, um, the whole higher education sector more than well it, it well actually it almost doubles, not more than doubles. So in nineteen thirty nine, there's about five thousand students, 
Um, and by 1959, there's almost 9,000. And then from when Weyhert moves into the campus, um, or rather when the competition is, is, is won in 1963, in UCD at that point, there's 4,728 students. Sorry to bombard you with numbers, but it is interesting. So 4,700 or so. And by 1985, so 20 years later, there's 10,177. So this need to grow is, is, is really important. And, and I think what, why Weyhert's plan wins is that on the one hand, it brings cohesion and what Dennis talks about, the, the, it champions um, the encounter. So that we're walking under this walkway and we can meet staff and students. But on the other hand, it's not too rigid because there had been designs as UCD was acquiring the land. There was designs made by a former professor of architecture, J.V. Downs, for around the Merville site and the woodland. And then that moved over to the Belgrove um, Valley, which is where Belfield where, and where the kind of the science building runs down to the to to the to the road to the main entrance. And so it, but all of these designs were considered too rigid. There's a fear. There's a fear there of of being of being too too predictive or or rather prescriptive. Thank you, Alan. Um, Agnieszka, I know that for you this is a there's a whole on the one hand, this is part of the official history of UCD and the official history really uh, of Ireland, because UCD is a national university. But for you, of course, uh, this is part of your childhood, the making of this campus. Um, and because I suppose it represented the pretext on which you, you, your parents arrived into Dublin um, and presumably played quite a major part in your um, early time here. Could you talk a little bit about it, the, you, the campus from your point of view? Um, yes, I remember um, as a young child going there very often at weekends um, my dad particularly loved to go there and I think he was checking that the designs that he had in his head were working well in reality. And so he wanted to check, um, we would go off into the lake. We would go, um, kind of across the campus. It was lovely at weekends because it was, um, vacant. It was empty pre um, any residential students on, on campus. So it was nearly like a private place. Um, there would be a boat with their, their motorized boats on the lake and that was it. So it was nearly like a, an empty playground for us. Um, I have lovely memories of um, in the car park, there were these islands where the trees, the horse chestnuts have been preserved rather than just kind of flattening and uh, chopping down the existing trees. They were preserved on islands. And um, uh, we used to go there, my brother and I, um, with our father, and he would hoik us up onto the top of the islands and we would be collecting horse chestnuts which later he would um, uh, make into animal models for us. But uh, I also remember going on lots of um, biking, uh, triking trips and uh, lo learning to roller skate on the ramps and the smooth concrete surfaces. Um, it, was a, it was a wonderful place to go to. Were you living nearby at the time? Or was this well, a, was a, a sort of pilgrimage that you were making weekly or, or um, an extended back garden for you? Um, we didn't live that close. We were living in Dorky. Uh -huh, so okay. I guess it would have been about a half hour trip. Yeah. But um, yeah. I think that's why they told us that's why they chose to live in Dorky. Um, the, so it was close enough that he could uh, pop by on the way to work or that we could get there easily enough on a weekend. But it was kind of part of, it was integrated into our growing up. Yeah. <laughs> So, and did you, I mean, because of course, one of the things about it is that in the initial phase, Alan mentioned, you know, the numbers of students were, and there was nobody living on the campus. So it was, it yes. was yeah, a very different kind of place, bucolic, almost like a hidden world, as you say, particularly at the weekends. Um, do, I, I don't know if you've been visiting more recently or if you've felt the, the changes that have happened to it over, well, the decades since. Yes, um, I went probably as about six years ago um, to meet a student there 
and I uh, I was shocked at the difference because it, w- it was it was an evening and th- it was a summer evening and the campus was full. Um, many new buildings have arrived. Um, it, it had a very different atmosphere, but it, you know it's progression. Right? Yeah, and I have to say that I think that I think that the some of the qualities, the sort of open endedness that Alan referred to in the in the original plan, this idea of something sitting in landscape and not being too too rigid. Yes. Is still supporting the life of the campus, I think, is part of the reason that the landscape is still so present. And in fact, I think the landscape has become more to the forefront in recent years in terms of woodland walks and so on, but just a general feeling and understanding of that landscape and its presence. So I, I would have thought that that's a sort of testament to the enduring, um, what would you say, resilience of, of the original um, thinking that your yeah. father. Um, and and what an opportunity! I mean, for somebody at that relatively early stage of their career to um, to be given well such a responsibility, but such an opportunity. I mean, did did he talk about that aspect of it? That like it, it feels like he was certainly incredibly proud of it. Yeah, um, very. I felt very lucky. Um, it meant a, a lot. It, it, to win the competition because as well as the recognition from Ireland, it also meant um, a foot in the door into the West, leaving Poland and communism behind, which was um, actually half of their year group um, from architects left. Um, Many went to the States, many went to France, but they were very happy to arrive in Ireland. Mm. So, um, yes. And of course, it was a moment when, um, as Alan referred to, the, the, the university was in a way trying, well, was in the process of reinventing itself. It was moving out of the city. It was moving to this suburban location. And I suppose in, in so doing, it, it had to think again about what the nature of a university is and should be. And that's one of the, maybe if I could just turn to that broader question now and maybe come back to you, Valerie, um, because we've spoken in various ways, you know, about the campus as a place of amenity, a place of learning, a place of research, very particular kind of lines of inquiry, that are t- a place where there's a very large um, working community, day by day, week by week, and then also a resident community now. So it's a, very, it's a, it's a settlement of over 30,000 people now um, at, its, at its busiest, larger than Kilkenny, for instance. Um, so... It, it, and yet, at the same time, it's largely pedestrian in terms of how people move around it. It has a very particular kind of aspect. How, how do you, how, and I know you've worked a lot in campuses and you've built a lot of buildings um, in universities. So what's your take on how we build for the university? If, if I can put that broad question to you. Well, I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting question because, I, and I like what, what Ellen was saying about this idea of the, of the kind of the endless growth potential of Andre Wachert's plan, which I think really does survive. And it's probably the strongest thing about UCD that, that, that you have a sense of this routeway and you have a sense of landscape. And um, as a result, then new buildings trying to create a sense of place within that is really important. And the set piece buildings that Ronan describes, they're very strong pieces. Um, you know, I, I, I know we'll, we'll come back and talk about favorite buildings and so on in it, but I do think there's a sense of, um, of, of being able to absorb large numbers of people. And uh, that, I think, is a, is a hugely important aspect of, of university campus planning, that you're not presented constantly with, with, with huge tranches of people, but that people can begin to make their own spaces within the environment that's there. So the potential to make small, um, environmentally suitable places is immensely important. And things like change of levels, um, change of materials, the way that buildings actually create space. And what Ronan was saying about actually creating, uh, I'm sorry, Dennis was saying about creating um, kind of buffers to wind because, I mean, I, I remember UCD when, when we were students of architecture, we used to go out to UCD um, school uh, only once a year because we were in Earlsford Terrace. Um, and you'd go out to UCD to, to go and sign on and register and you queue up and end up going to the O'Reilly, uh, sorry, the, the Tierney building. Um, but I always loved that connection between the Tierney building and the arts block and those fabulously vertiginous lecture theatres, yeah. which to me um, were like Pergamon and actually 
when I much later on got to see Pergamon, I thought actually the same thing was. It's like UCD. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, but I mean, but even in built in the name and the amphitheater, you know, the, yeah. it, the memory of the sort of earlier forms of gathering is one that Dennis also referred to. It's a very old idea, the idea of the campus, mm -hmm. the idea um, of that kind of learning. And in fact, of course, the, Dennis just coming to you maybe and, and thinking about that, the Socratic idea and so mm -hmm. on. That this idea of what, what's interesting about the nature plan is that so much of it is about where, how you get from one place to another. It's about the places, but it's also about the connective tissue, the famous walkways, the, cover, the canopied walkways. I mean, is that there, that connective tissue aspect of the of the university? Is that something that that you pick up on? Because again, I know you 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 make a lot of buildings in in campuses. You think a lot about educational architecture. Mm -hmm. What are the things that are on the yes working in that way? There's no doubt about it. The I think the um, I, I think that placemaking is is univer university architecture is fundamentally about placemaking and those places are not the places i i think that people normally associate with placemaking which are really buildings but it's very much the, t the connective tissue between those buildings and the sort of environment that exists between them where people move people move between university buildings probably more than they do any other form of building i, sh I should think except perhaps a, a busy retail street or something like that in a townscape um, so th so that, that, that connective tissue is terribly important. And as a tribute to Andre, I remember meeting as a young architect when I designed the Vet College, and we, we, won, we, likewise, we won that in, in competition. For me, that was a very exciting prospect. And I, I met with Andre and, um, and spoke to him about the, about the master plan, because that was one of the first buildings that actually broke the, 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 the slightly orthogonal grid that had been formed. And I, I and did so for very good reason, because it was a question of making the academic part of the building connect and comes back to this issue of connection to the lake and then to make the non, the hospital part, to connect to the pub, more public realm of roadways and so on and so forth. So there was good purpose to it, but I was very conscious that it was, it, it, it could well be seen as, as out of kilter. I remember speaking to Andre about that and, and meeting with him. And I, I was quite anxious about it, as you can imagine. I was, I was meeting a, an, an elder lemon, as it were. I, I wasn't grey at that stage myself. Um, so the, um, we, we spoke about it. And what struck me immediately was, first and foremost, how, how wonderfully self-effacing and how charming Andre was and how, how receptive he was to, to discussing all of this. But also it became absolutely apparent how resilient the 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 the, the, uh, the plan was and how it could in fact take quite quite a, a sort of a, a dent and a kick and so on and so forth and I'm delighted to say that I've been involved personally involved in designing I think it's eight buildings now at this stage I'm in the eighth building on at UCD and without exception every single one of those has referred to to, to the master plan and to that framework that was, that was considered which I think is very interesting but I think the and it, and I reason it works, I believe, and the more buildings that have been built and the more spaces that have been created have actually reinforced the value of that connective tissue, those, those connections between buildings. And I think it's, it, it, it is one of the, it's rather like decent wine. I think it's going to improve with time. And it's, it's extraordinary um, tribute to its resilience that you can actually add more buildings to that without destroying it, without, 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 without ruining the, the purity, as it were, and the simplicity and the elegance of that plan. Um, in a way, you are so right. I mean, you know, yeah. It's the generosity, that, isn't it? Sorry, Valerie, jump it's in. Like the generosity of that. It's the generosity of the original gesture. And as yeah. you said, yes, Andre was such an ama amazing, modest person, uh, very self effacing mm. but at the mm. same time strong. And I think that's a, a wonderful combination yes. for openness yes. and things to happen. And, and uh, that kind of resilience and openness certainly affected me in, in, in my architectural development, too. But there's also yes. that the, yes. the aspect, just the circumstance of the making of the combining of those pieces of land to make the what is very large is, um, estate within which to begin to build a university means that there's that room, there's always scope, there's room to maneuver. I mean, it's sometimes yes. it's, it's kind of like when you put furniture into an empty room and you make it seem big mm. because suddenly you're discovering the possibilities. Yes, and yes. Can we add something? I think in. that's a very interesting analogy. Yeah. I also um, think that I think 
I sorry, Hugh, to interrupt you, but I also think that it's very interesting that at, you know, it is at this relatively late stage in the development of, of the campus that the um, the antiques, as it were, as in the original uh, estate buildings that made up the space, are find, so now finding a real place in there. And I think that's a very exciting prospect. So the likes of Ardmore House um, and the likes of the, the, the Clinton Institute building and all of these are suddenly feeling comfortable in that new environment. And I, I personally find that's, that, that, that's a great attraction. And I, again, it comes back to reinforcing the, 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 that, that element of glue that can, can yeah, to, you know, pulls all the, the very disparate parts together. And of course, I, I hate to say it, but, it, but part of this Belfield 50 is the fact that the, we're now recognising that that first wave of university architecture, the Belfield architecture, is itself now becoming heritage is probably not the right word, but we have to think about it now in a different way. And one thinks particularly maybe of the Tierney building, the um, the restaurant building, of course, as being, um, and I must say my yes. own memory of the, the treks to Belfield, not from as far afield, but from Richview, which is mm. on the ed on the other edge of the campus, mm. or always to the restaurant building. I'm going to, you can tell I'm mm. going to go to you on this, Ronan, because this is a Scott Talent Walker building. Um, and part of that, certainly the early era of Belfield um, development. And again, seem to have an idea about a very sim a simple, straightforward idea about making a great gathering place for the student and staff community. Is that something that, uh, and again, you're, you've worked a lot on campus architecture. Um, is that sense of wanting to make places where people can gather um, and come together, is that part of how you go about thinking about building in a university? Who was that question for? Ronan, sorry. Well, that, that was a question for me. But I think oh, wow. you, 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 uh, you raised a very interesting point about the, the restaurant building, and I think it was one of the, one of the first buildings that was built in about the 70s, so it was part of complementing the original master plan. And that restaurant was designed um, to, serve the whole, to serve the whole university at that point in time. But when you and I were in, uh, in Richview, like you say, it was a trek across, uh, uh, across to Belfield and difficult enough sometimes to find a centre. And, yeah. and for me, the restaurant building was the centre of UCD. And in many ways, it was the, it was, it was the forum for, for yeah. UCD. And yeah. um, so just to, to describe a little bit about the building, it, it, it's on that very strong linear pedestrian axis that Andre set up. But the building is kind of designed in a dip. So it's a very simple structure with this kind of square building with a concrete roof supported on these ridiculously skinny columns. Um, but because of the sentinel dip, you kind of enter the building in the middle. So in the middle of the building are the social spaces. And upstairs was all the posh dining where the lecturers and, 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 uh, and everyone could have their proper dinner. But then it was connected with these lovely double height spaces. And then downstairs was this really, uh, I suppose, democratic canteen and with what struck me about is any time I visited it and perhaps form is too grand the word but it seemed to be the one place where people from all different faculties yeah. like friends who were doing law or business or commerce as it was at the time or, or arts as, as, as preferred the humanities uh, everybody was there so that was the only big central space under cover yeah. in, in UCD where you could meet, uh, meet and greet. And those spaces, those inside spaces, are just as important as the outside meeting yeah. spaces because yeah. we all know we're, we're in an Irish uh, environment with the Irish weather and the university year is starts in the, starts in the autumn and, uh, and ends in the spring. Mm. You know? yeah. so, sh so shelter and covering in UCD has always been a, yeah. a very important factor. <laughs> And of course, Dennis also referred or, or touched on it, uh, as did Valerie, that the particular character of the university building is you're going to have these great pulses of movement of people mm. pretty much on the hour, every hour. And um, one feels it certainly in Belfield, uh, less so in, in Richview where we are, it's quieter, but just the gr everyone on the move and then everyone settles back again and then everyone is on the move again. Yeah. So it actually gives a particular character to the architecture, doesn't it, that it has... In places, it have to have have to have the capacity to absorb, to use Valerie's word, mm -hmm. great numbers of people, 
and then at the same time it has to serve very particular functions and often very very complex like laboratory setups and uh, so it has a whole different it has a very specific functional uh, yeah, that's a good point and i think it's interesting to observe that the people flow and, and if you're building a building in, in UCD, as a, a gallery and De De Dennis will know, you really need to look at that particular site and that particular place and study how people flow and move within the campus around that space. Because some of the most interesting spaces are, are, are made by almost accidental routes, yeah. like what I would call like the, mm. kind of the desire line that the students yeah. and staff create through mm. the university, which are not necessarily the lines along which the designers intended them to move. Yeah. Mm. So the bus stop down on the, on the, on the motorway, the, the direct line from that bus stop up towards the Bank of Ireland building and weaving around alongside the lake up towards the, up towards the library is, is one of the busiest axes uh, almost as busy as, as the linear axis cutting to the yeah. right angles. So when you come across a site in UCD, the opportunity, if you recognize where those desire lines are, really, that can inform yeah, yeah. the shape of the yeah. function of the building. There's already a kind of, a kind of latent intelligence there from yeah. how people are already moving. Alan, you were going to come in on that. No, well, no, it was just funny. It was, it was two things. I was just going to say that the restaurant was designed and, and at one point, for however long, through the 1970s, maybe through the 80s, to serve 10,000 meals a day. Is that not a mad amount? Um, All the same as well. All the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And a certain, a very thin piece of meat, I believe. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting that the, the second um, building where everybody finds themselves is also a building built at the same time, late 60s and finished in the early years of the 70s, which was phase one of John Hardy Glover's library, uh, Basil, Basil Spence's practice, the Scottish practice. Um, and so both of those buildings, uh, Robin Walker's restaurant and, and, and the Spence Glover or Hardy Ferguson um, library are, are both built by other people to fit in or by... by Put into a different palette to fit into this Weyhert plan. And so again, it's referring to, to, to Valerie's generosity there, this inherent generosity of Andre's um, that is that that's that is resilient and enduring. There, Alan, to say um, Alvar Alto, when he was designing university campuses in Finland, uh, I, I remember going to, to see one uh, again when I was a penniless student and trying to manage to live in Finland for even a week was an enormous challenge. Yeah of intense and, and a lot of rain and so on. But the fabulous thing about, say, the, the Uvascula um, campus or the Otoniemi campus is that Alto, when he finished these, he would uh, kind of get somebody with a, who took around with a barrow of sand. And what he had that person instructed to do was to follow where all the students were going. And every time he saw a student take a wandering path across a bit of landscape, that guy was instructed to go in with the barrow to go and drop a load of sand down along it so that he would actually encapsulate the desire lines that everybody had. And I think that's a really interesting kind of thought about how do you make these connections. It's about observation, it's about instinct, but it's also about allowing people the possibility of deciding themselves, which is what you really want in a university, is for people to start learning what, they're, what they are, who they are, where they might want to go, and, and to be exposed. And I think that's just one of the most wonderful things about those kinds of scenarios. And I thought that was a great story about Alto and the Barrow of Sand. It's also, a, the campus also tends to be an index of how, of, well, if I don't want to say societal change, but certainly changes in thinking about how society is structured, maybe. And so if you move from a situation where you've got single large gathering spaces to, to I would say now it's much more, there are smaller spaces dropped you know, distributed around the campus where people mm -hmm. can convene and do all kinds of different things in all kinds of different ways. There's more, there's more variety, there's more choice perhaps. And then there's also this sense that um, to a large extent, there's an awful lot of what's now called learning commons, generally speaking. In other words, much less strictly denominated teaching space, space where students can be. They have a laptop, they can access the library. I'm always struck by the fact that the library now says it's busy, it is at its busiest at midnight on a Sunday. 
when it's closed because that's when the most users are online. So the, the library, in a way, so many facilities are now available to students remotely, as we are discovering <laughs> um, at the moment. So it also then says, well, then what is a campus? It, it, if it's the case that you can take a lec- you can look at a lecture on your laptop, you know, you, I don't know if you could yet design a building entirely without a studio or do a science lab t- um, session without a lab. But nonetheless, the balance is shifting. Um, and Dennis, I know that that you you've been thinking about in, that in recent projects, where that that need for these kind of just undenominated space where students can mm-hmm. get in mm-hmm. group, just sit on their mm-hmm. own. Mm-hmm. The demands are different, aren't they? Sorry, I, if you, I missed your last word there. Apologies. I think that, that maybe just to talk a little bit about that, that, that the, the changing demands are, I guess, the changing nature of student life. Oh yes, it, I think I think this comes back to the importance of place as, as as opposed to the importance of building per se and uh, sort of sort of nominating buildings per se, and the and, and that massive importance of, of of congregation in our in as as social beings as so as social species. I think yes, we we do of course, and we are learning very quickly to to operate remotely. But that said, the, if of a poll of our 150 odd staff who are all working remotely and very successfully and, and, and very bravely and everything else. The one common denominator is that that lack of, of physical touch, that lack of actually being able to talk to one another. And, and delightfully, it's our, our junior, more junior staff, less experienced staff, are missing the, the idea of, me, of mentoring, direct mentoring. Um, and you don't, you know, you, for people who you might arguably expect a little arrogance in a sense that I can do it on my own, there's, there's actually quite the opposite, that sense that what I'm really missing is mentoring. And I think one of the, what we're really about in our in university buildings and university space making is about recognizing the importance of that forum, the, the importance of that place where people can, can formally meet or, as I said a little earlier, can enjoy a chance encounter. And the surprise that comes from that and it, it, I think there's those sort of spaces and those sort of um, uh, ped, pedagogical spaces are, 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 are literally about opening opportunity for both surprise encounter and formal encounter. Yeah. And I don't think you get that. Online. You don't get that. I, I, actually, I'm, I'm interested that you're saying that the library in UCD is busiest. At, at before midnight on a Sunday. Um, the library that we just built in India, to our total surprise, when we were going back there and doing kind of post, post-occupation post studies and what have you, we discovered that the library was most used between 9 a.m. and 2 a.m., sorry, 9 p.m. and 2 p.m. at night. And it was just, it wasn't just about the library as a facility, but it was the library as a meeting space. As a meeting space, uh, yeah. You know, because there's a bit more segregation. You, education. Yeah. I would. We yeah. always met girls. To the library. Dennis recently the completed the library for the University of Limerick, and yeah. um, and it's very University of Limerick library, calling itself a library per se, and it, it University of Limerick and they they admitted this themselves are are quite conservative in their in in their attitudes generally, and they 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 now are recognising the library as and as as a meeting place and the importance of that and as a forum. And they're using buzzwords like, you know, it's a maker space and it's, an, it's, it's, a, place for, it's a place for invention and such like. like In that library, in fact, one of, the, one of the most fundamental things we've done is we've removed books from the library in the main and we've, we, we're, they, are, they are stored in a central uh, depository, which can be accessed quite easily. But we have opened the floors up and that library is packed permanently. I mean, I wouldn't have wanted uh, and, to give- and, you know, And there was a major major debate as to whether it should ever happen or not. So I, I think I'm not, I, I don't fear for yeah. the, the future of university buildings and, mm-hmm. and the, the, those meeting places, those, those places for encounter. I think they're very important. I, and I, I, mean, I should say that although the library is at its busiest on Sunday night, it's also really busy during the day. It's also really busy mm-hmm. as a yeah. time. In, it's jam packed, and actually, they say they have a queue waiting, and they open in the morning. Partly because mm-hmm. students are coming up on buses from all parts of the country, arriving in the campus, and don't have somewhere to go, don't have a base. Mm-hmm. So then, the library is mm-hmm. a really important space, you know, that just gives you a, an, an anchor, you know, a footing. 
And but just to maybe to, to come back around, I'm also thinking about Agnieszka's um, description of the campus as another world, you know, wandering through it and feeling and, and sort of thinking, I guess, that how important it is to have access. The feeling I think when you come as a student to to a university is of entering a world where somehow learning and scholarship is valued and freedom of thought, um, freedom of expression, mm. all of these things. It, it, it embodies a certain sort of, and it, it makes you, um, it puts you on your best performance, I think, in a way. It makes you up your game or challenges you, but also supports you. And it's somehow that, that gets communicated, I think, doesn't it, through the, the, the campus and its architecture and its landscape. And maybe just to come back around to Agnieszka and just thinking now, now about um, back to the specifics of the campus, Agnieszka, I wanted to ask if you had a favorite um, place or maybe a building or a landscape or a, something that really struck you about um, Belfield during your visits there with your father. Or maybe if, if you know that he had a favorite place within it. Well, um, his favorite place was the lake. I know he loved that sense of openness. And um, I think it was kind of like a a heart, a meeting place that he envisaged, a place where people could relax. Um, <laughs> but mine is something different. Um, I, For me, the structure that I love most, out of, probably out of all, all, actually, is the water tower. So even beyond Belfield, out of their kind of um, lifetime's work. Yeah. Um, and why it's become important, uh, you know, as a child uh, at our home, we could go for walks and we'd look out over across to Belfield, across the city, to Dublin, to see, and you'd the, the water tower. And now I, I live in Wales and it's like a beacon when I'm either coming, arriving by ferry uh -huh. Or leaving, uh, or even you know by plane, I can spot the water tower. Somehow, it's a very benevolent form. Yeah, yeah. And, it's uh, funny. That I, I like it. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. It took us so long to come around to it, but of course, the water tower is such an important element. So you have the lake, which is the sort of natural, natural amenity at the, at the centre, and then the landmark, which is the water tower, which mm -hmm. is a, a sort of piece of a structure that is so idiosyncratic, and yet. Mm. seem inevitable you know now to us that it's, yeah it's it's kind of like the uh, an landscape. icon yeah yeah it's, it's an icon for mm. belfield i think yeah dennis how about you do you have a favorite um belfield place i i like i i i, I it's a very very um it's a very sort of partisan view i like belfield because belfield is i i didn't i didn't study architecture at belfield but i practiced architecture at belfield and and i'm proud of what's happened there and i'm i'm, I'm proud of because it has allowed it, it allows you to create nice places so i i like belfield in overall i feel a real fondness for it if if i'm if i have to, if i have to choose a a, a structure or a building um, I'm sl I'm slightly torn, and this is not designed to Plamos Valerie in any way. I'm slightly torn between the Virology Reference Lab, which I've always liked as a jewellery box, sort of sitting in a, in slightly, in sli dare I say it, slightly incongruously in amongst all of these quite these quite masculine structures and this this delightful little box is sitting there, and it's, it's a great surprise. And I, I so. I'm, I'm torn between that and the restaurant building, which to me is just represents one of the most iconic pieces of, of world architecture in this country. And there it is, sitting in the context of this campus, which is, it's, it's quite a magical thing to own, to have a, a piece of work like that, uh, you know, as part of, part of your, your built heritage. I think it's absolutely lovely and delightful. And I really would fight tooth and nail to protect it and make sure that it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's always recognized as such. But Valerie... Um, I, because you're well, in fact, good as me, uh, Ronan. I better be careful here what I say. I might give, I might tip my the balance in favour of Valerie because I, I, she described her building so in such a charming way that I, I grew to like it even more. No, uh, but uh, Valerie, do you want to? <laughs> well, <laughs> by the way, you don't have to reciprocate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know Ronan. Is allowed to say that uh, he likes the restaurant building because it's a Scott Tyler Walker building, but. I'm right with you there, Dennis. I think it, I think the restaurant building is a stunning building, and I loved. And uh, even though when we used to go to the the Tierney building to 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 register, 
you're absolutely right. You, I kind of forgotten because it was in the kind of pleasure sense, sense of things that we always then used to go to there and probably to the bar in the end. But that sense of the levels, of, of the ingenuity of the levels and this incredible sort of thing of holding up the column in the middle uh, of, of the span mm. uh, and no columns at the corner, yeah. it's just fantastic. Mm. And I, I'm just thinking actually in this fifth year thinking about the, the whole campus, it'll be tremendously important to maintain the proper materiality of those, all those buildings. Mm. Like the Waychart buildings with their beautiful bronze windows and lovely surfaces. And, you know, I mean, I know that the library, I, I kind of like it, but I, don't, I like the exterior of it, but I don't really find the interior of it too conducive because mm. it just doesn't seem to have enough ventilation or mm. I don't know what. But there's a sense that there's, there's edges of the campus where people could quite quickly destroy that very fragile sense of the 1960s and how optimistic and fantastic it was and what generous materials mm. and beautiful materials yep. were used in all of the buildings. Yes. And like that, that lovely sense of arrival when you come into the, um, the middle level of the, of the restaurant building. I mean, that's, it's unforgettable. Mm. So I think you're totally right, Dennis. Mm. Go tooth and nail to, to just protect those buildings. I think they're all, you know, there's a lot of very, very good buildings that, that UCD has built up as a kind of a, a lexicon. And it's, yep. it's wonderful. It's fantastic as a kind of a, so in we, our legacy to the next generation. So we have, uh, we have a couple of votes, one and a half at least for the restaurant, but Roland, you're not allowed to the restaurant. Yeah. Well, I'm not, and Hugh, when, this, when I got the list of quest, potential questions for this discussion, <laughs> I was always worried that I'd be asked last about favourite oh, space okay. on the campus because <laughs> <laughs> I, I could, pre could, could predict the structures like the water tower and uh, Valerie's building would be picked and would be would be front runners. So I'm going to I'm going to cheat slightly, uh, and perhaps controversially, I'm going to nominate the quadrangle in Richview as being what was my favourite space yeah. uh, in UCD. And I think that's because even though we were in as part of Belfie, like you say, it took 20 minutes to walk there. So that quadrangle defined for us our own centre and our own little mini sense of campus. Now that will be rectified by uh, the new Centre for Creative Design building, which will move uh, architecture into the centre of the campus. But I always thought that that was a lovely little little space. It's it's quite a small space. It's kind of maybe half the size of a uh, of a school football pitch along its length. But the way it's arranged with the library, the memorial hall, and the uh, and the studios, there was just there was such a constant traffic across that space that it was a real great, great social hub. And my, like my memory is that like I, I I went to literally 1984, so 85, spring of 85, there was a big snow, and I remember there was we had a um, big snowball fight in the in the middle of the quadrangle, and that snowball fight involved all five years throughout the Faculty of Architecture. And I probably met more people across the rest of the faculty during that one social interaction than in all the months coming up to it. So, yeah. and I think it's particularly relevant now since we've all been locked up in our homes for the last couple of months. I think everybody is now becoming much more conscious of the preciousness and the value of even the smallest outdoor public social space um, and I just I just hope that I think there's a real opportunity that when people come back to work that even socially if we can just get an awful lot better at, at demanding better quality spaces like that no matter how small they are but really defending the quality and the integrity of those spaces and, and I suppose demanding that they are preserved or even and, and designed into all walks of buildings, not only universities. Yeah. And again, it, com it comes back to the point that so much of the success of the first of the master plan was actually precisely about those spaces that bind us and bind places together, the stuff between, the spaces between. Um, I want to draw the, Ellen, I know I'm not supposed to go to you on this question, am I? Or will I go to you on this question or will we conclude? No, no. I mean, you can conclude unless you really want to hear another thing from me. But you um, can. <laughs> I'm kidding. But, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just conscious of time, and I know yeah. Valerie has gone for time as well. But I suppose just to say, um, th this is one of I know many events that are going to be happening 
to uh, mark the 50th anniversary of Belfield. And I suppose what it's shown us already is the, the richness of the legacy of everything that of everything that has been built over the 50 years that Belfield has been in existence. And actually, I suppose the promise that we're going to need to continue to build and to continue to invent and reinvent the campus uh, over the coming 50 years uh, and beyond. So I'd like to just thank our contributors very much. It was a very rich and interesting uh, conversation that took us down. I think some unexpected avenues and also uh, a chance to revisit uh, some very familiar uh, spaces and in, in, and learn new uh, things about them and gain new insights about a campus that we think we know, but that continues to surprise us. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank everybody. You. Thank you so much.